Greetings, students. I know that many of you right now are thinking about how to integrate generative AI into your practice and how to work with the teachers that are in your school about issues relating to privacy and ethics and also um, how AI might increase uh, documentation and also student creativity. So let's explore um, the, the connections to our role. In this lecture, I am not going to go under the hood and get very technical uh, about what AI and generative AI are. I'm Frankly, I'm not an expert in that, but I am pretty good at understanding integrating technologies into curriculum. So we're going to focus on that. We're also going to focus on how generative AI may help us um, streamline our work and actually help us see dots uh, to be more innovative, things that we might not have considered in the past, but we can integrate once we discover um, realms beyond our own disciplines that we can connect. So, um, so let's get started. I am going to be your librarian uh, for a little bit of a petting zoo. The petting zoo might happen after the lecture and you might be able to use what I'm gonna share with you with your faculty and perhaps with some students. By the way, that image was made with an AI tool uh, called My Heritage Time Machine. This one has a little bit of a cost, but I had such fun uh, putting myself back in history. So um, this is a link to one version of our petting zoo, which I'll show you a little bit later, and this, this slide will come around again. So today we're gonna be sharing use cases. We'll be discussing buckets of AI tools. Uh, we'll have a conversation, or at least I'll talk a little bit about academic honesty issues, and we'll talk about that in the uh, Canvas shell. Um, and then I'll share with you a little bit about that petting zoo and I promise to leave you with lots of resources that will be dynamic because I keep updating everything. Eric um, Shinseki, a, a general and former chief of staff for the U.S. Army, uh, said, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. So for those of us who don't think um, Generative AI is our business, I think you may want to change the way you think of it. Um, I did want to share with you that um, a lot of the resources um, that I had did not even fit in the petting zoo. So there is this hyperdoc, which is really rich with materials that um, when you need it, it's there for you and I'd love for you to take, uh, take a peek. Um, it, within it, you'll see a lot of the pearl trees collections that I have been gathering relating to AI in teaching and learning. So you can get to most of those through the HyperDoc. So right now, uh, I don't think putting your head in the sand like an ostrich is a great idea. Uh, in terms of our five roles, one of them, as you know, is leader. Uh, and I think this is an area where librarian leadership is important. So we need to take our heads up and hold them high and, and lead the other folks around us. Uh, AI is, this is one of so many articles that shared how AI is already teach, uh, changing teaching. It's not just for students um, and we can use it to be more productive and more creative ourselves. I find that I need to, to look at the ideas of other important people, and I have a network of people that I go to. Some are in higher ed, some are in K-12, some are consultants, some are researchers, uh, some are academic librarians, um, and these people um, are thinking far ahead of me, and I think they're worth following. So please take an opportunity uh, to follow them. On the K-12 level, you may want to look at Dan Fitzpatrick, Eric Cutts, Holly Clark, and Monica Burns. And Matt Miller, sorry. All of those folks are, are real thought leaders and so creative. The fact is our students will need to work symbiotically with AI tools for search, for knowledge management, and for creativity. 
the world is going to be working with AI, AI EDU, which is an, an organization that has put out an awful lot of really useful tools, explored how AI is going to be used in a bunch of different industries in the future. We're seeing AI used in early detection of breast cancer, uh, and there's just so much going on in terms of identifying trends and, and really working across disciplines in ways that we hadn't before. So just to give you a very basic background, generative AI is a branch of artificial intelligence that uses machine learning algorithms to create new content, text, images, videos, sounds, code, and calculations. It's probably growing even more than, than those, and that's a lot. Uh, it works by learning from a large data set of examples and then using the knowledge to generate new content. It's often used in conjunction with natural language processing and computer vision techniques to create realistic outputs. In fact, um, in terms of images, all the image I'm, images I'm using in this slide deck have been created mostly with Adobe Firefly, but um, probably a few of them uh, with Microsoft Bing Chat as well and possibly Bard. Um, generative AI has the potential to transform a variety of fields, including education. It can enable personalized learning experiences, facilitate the creation of resources, function as an assistant, and provide new ways of supporting and assessing learning. It will be used in nearly every field your students enter, and AI literacy is becoming a thing. When you think about it, um, it is connected to all the other literacies that we already teach, and I believe this is um, one we're going to need uh, to add to our toolkits in terms of instruction. There are, I've just, um, there are many ways to define AI literacy. What I did was synthesize definitions from across the literature, and you can read this and, and, and think about where it, this, all of these skills fit into what you're already teaching. Of course, um, we all know that there are concerns about AI use, uh, and they're serious. We're concerned about the authority and accuracy of our information, the provenance of the information we're getting, the false um, information we're getting. Sometimes people call that hallucinations. I think they're calling them that less and less. Intellectual property ethics, um, there, you'll see that all over the news, and we're, gonna, we're seeing more recently that there are invisible watermarks that are appearing on art that is generated by AI, so folks can tell that it isn't original. Um, you can all, you can look through all of these. One of the interesting ones is de-skilling, whether or not AI will replace human jobs um, and whether it will diminish student agency voice and innovation. And um, you're seeing already, um, even at the um, K-12 level, students are involved in creating deep fakes. Uh, so this, these are things that we absolutely need, be, need to be concerned about. Um, again, this is another list of things to be concerned about. Bias, the information quality, privacy and security. When you enter things into a chat box, does the chat box own the stuff? What will they do with your own writing? What will they do with your own art? What will they do with your images? Uh, fact checking is again essential and that's one of the things we teach about all the time. Um, the source of the data set. Remember, garbage in, garbage out. Where is the chatbot or the search tool or the, tool, the material you're using getting its content? And so all these things need to be thought of and they're all part of building AI literacy. There are many articles out there that describe the bias that is inherent in generative AI, again, this is garbage in, garbage out, but also um, where is the information coming from? Is it coming only uh, from uh, Western white men? And uh, these five women were in, um, I think it was Rolling Stone, and uh, the, one, of the, one of the women, uh, Professor Gebru, said there were no black people, no, literally no black people in the room, and she was born in Ethiopia. I would go to academic conferences on AI and I would see four or five black people out of five, six, seven thousand people internationally. I saw who was building the AI systems and their attitudes and their points of view. I saw what they were being used for and I was like, oh my God, we have a problem. 
Again, something that we need to consider. Um, if you were in 530 with me or one of the other classes, you read uh, Sophia Noble's, um, you, you heard her speech, um, Algorithms of Oppression. Um, this is becoming more pronounced as we're looking at bias in AI. Uh, here's an example. Uh, when I use BARD, I get a warning. Your conversations are processed by human reviewers to improve technologies powering BARD. Don't enter anything you wouldn't want reviewed or used. And so if you have an unpublished paper, recognize that when you put it up, it's, uh, it's becoming part of the learning data. When you put a, an article to which um, you don't have ownership, you're doing the same thing. Um, when you ask a personal question and you get data based on, say you put um, a diagnosis from a doctor, that's becoming part of the training data. Okay, now let's shift gears. We've had a bunch of warnings and what we should look out for, but let's look at what AI can do for us. Um, I'm fond of Abraham Maslow's quote, I suppose it's tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. We have a growing toolkit. We have our traditional tools that still are going to be hugely helpful, but we also have tools of the future. And AI is still in its infancy. Our toolkits are growing, but I do want you to be aware of what you've got. Two phrases that, or two statements that, one of them, which I've already mentioned, are really important. Um, if garbage in, garbage out, your prompt is going to determine how good your informa the information you uh, get back is. And also, keep the lumen, human in the loop. If you're not getting good information, you're the thinker. You're the one who is going to keep prompting and, uh, and making a difference in the quality of the information that's returned. We're going to talk a little bit about large language models and how they support AI search and research. If you have worked in um, an academic library, you know that the ACRL frames really talk about ser searching as strategic exploration. And I think that this particular uh, part of the framework um, is, is useful in terms of how students are going to approach AI as research and search tools. Um, I'm a big fan, as you saw, his, um, you saw his image in my thought leaders. Um, this is Aaron Tay. Uh, he is in Singapore and he has been doing a lot of serious thinking about AI. The things that he's wondering about, will academic search engines producing direct answers and citations be the norm? I wonder what that's going to mean in terms of our use of databases. Will academic search engines use semantic search rather than keyword search as the default? What are the implications of that? Um, what will the business model for sprints be? You're seeing so many um, startups and APIs developed that use the large language models. Some of them are free and open. Some of them are a pay. Um, and then how useful would these new features be? So let's think about some use cases for large language models and how we might use generative AI to help us. These are some of the major large language models, and these maybe you may find these in other bots, uh, but these are the big ones at this point. You'll notice that there's a privacy notice that many of them share um, saying that, hey, we're gonna collect your conversations and we're gonna use your um, data to make things better um, in terms of our, our responses. And so you should be aware that anything that you load may become part of the learning data. This is an example of how Chat GPT-4, BARD, and Bing Chat, which I believe is now gonna be called Copilot, responded to in what ways might a teacher get ready for the upcoming semester using um, a large language model. And they're, they're, they gave pretty similar responses. Note that um, they, the responses are formatted differently. Also note that 
some of these work with images and also note that some of these will give you citations. You can see them in the bottom right on Bing Chat. So some of the use cases that I've come up with, um, I, was, I have a colleague who was thinking about writing a book on um, famous couples who achieved greatness. And so he said to me, um, let's think beyond um, Marie and Pierre Curie. And I said, this is a perfect research project for AI because of its ability to search across disciplines and uh, across database, databases and search engines. And so you can see that um, using three of these uh, large language models, we got ideas that I would not have thought of. We, for instance, well, I probably would have come up with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. But um, there were, and you can see that one of them um, created it by, actually most of them organized these by discipline. But again, we're seeing dots that we might not have considered within our own vision had we not looked at a large language model. So brainstorming for a research project is a use case. Identifying possible examples. Again, this is similar. Um, generate a list of Latina poets. I'm a high school student looking for poems to analyze for my English course. And so here is a lovely list of Latina poets. Not only did it give me the poets, but it gave, them, it gave me examples of their better known poems. And so this is a great starting point. I'm not starting with a blank sheet of paper. I've used AI to help me brainstorm. Now, if I were the teacher and I was helping the teacher develop the assessment, I would suggest at what point I want them to use AI to, for brainstorming, for instance, but do I want them to use AI as they analyze the poem and perhaps compare one poet to another? Maybe not. And so we'll talk about these red light, green light things in a little bit. Um, one, another, another reason to use AI, a use case, is to identify primary sources across a body of literature. In this case, I was working with a religion teacher um, and there was an assignment on comparative religion. He said, well, how can I use AI in an ethical way um, to get my students used to using it, but to make sure that their products are ethically produced, honest, and meaningful? And I said, well, here, this is perfect because what you're looking at is a large body of literature in comparative religion, primary sources. And so how about we start with this? We'll use one of the um, themes that you're talking about. So in this case, the question or the prompt, compare the ways a variety of sacred texts from major faiths address the subject of an afterlife and include quotes from each. This legwork would have taken hours and hours for a student to do. But now um, we've gotten to the nub of the problem. We can say to the student, um, okay, you have identified these. Maybe there are others. Um, you, can, you can look on your own, but this is a starting point. Um, but um, I want you to do the analysis on your own. If you're going to compare Hinduism to Islam in terms of the afterlife, um, I want that analysis to be completely your own work. So you've acknowledged the use of AI productively and you've suggested what the work flow is going to be for the student. Now, if you look at this, you'll notice that one major faith is missing and I kind of knew why, but I, the thing I want my students to do is wonder about the, re, the results returned. And so I said um, to the search tool, I don't know that my, my prompt is there. Oh, yes, it is. Please add Judaism. And so it noted that um, the afterlife in Judaism is not a fixed destination, but rather a place of judgment and reward. And so it was different and wasn't included. But it's important that your students know to ask questions about the absence of information that you would have expected to find there. Um, when our students are using databases, they may not immediately come in contact with the controlled vocabulary, and maybe they want some preloading. So in this case, I asked um, the I asked Bard to share controlled vocabulary relating to ADHD from a variety of different databases, the SORI, and I, I prompted it that I wanted it to check. Um, well, I don't think I did, because I'm assuming I'm a student who didn't know all the thesauri. So um, it did check. It checked Eric. It knew what to check. Psych info, mesh. Um, and I could see variation across the databases. While there was a lot of similarity, um, 
I didn't see hyperkinetic disorder in those words uh, in MeSH. Um, and then it's listed as syndrome in Eric. So this makes a difference when you're just when you're trying to gather all the articles that use these things as a subject. And it's good for students to know that. Um, I also asked in which library databases uh, might I research ADHD and learning. And so it came up with Scopus, PubMed, and gave you, gave you the icons too, JSTOR, and the Directory of Open Access Journals. Um, this is not, of course, um, a, a full list of the helpful databases, but um, it's a start. And what I notice here is that some of these are free, and so that might help when you don't have the databases to support this. Um, I imagine that um, I had, like many times, my serious researchers were in my AP his U.S. history class. And so I, rather than um, me do all the work, and actually I could use this for, to support my LibGuide, suggest respected primary source research portals to help me understand the causes of the American Civil War. So here I'm asking for the free web portals, and um, it pretty much matched the materials that I put in my primary source uh, for the American Civil War study, LibGuide. And I probably, if I had missed one, I would have been able to pick it up there. Um, I could ask it to send me more um, if I wanted to. And through this, you know you can use these to create a Google personalized search. And so this is actually preloading. And so now you can search, if you, if you use these to create a Google custom or personalized search, you can use these to, um, to be the basis of it, and people can search across these portals very easily. Similarly, I had a student um, who was doing their search, their customized search on knitting, and uh, it took her hours to find some of these, and we compared this to what it would look like if she used AI. And many of these that took her hours to find, there were a couple that she didn't find, um, came up right away. And of course, what she did was check them and see if they were valuable to her personas for that Google personalized search. Think about it, uh, the use of AI for reader's advisory. Um, in this case, I asked for an annotated list of an, um, Afrofuturist books for young adults. Um, then I decided to refine that by asking it to return only award-winning Afrofuturist young adult books. And I got a slightly different list, but I was assured that they were award-winning. And then I asked it again in a different way for well-reviewed books. And so now I think I have a pretty decent list of Afrofuturist books. Why is this important? Um, it's it's part pos possibly important because there's no subject heading for it, uh, as far as I can tell. It's probably listed in novelists, but it's not listed in many of the catalogs yet. And you would have to kind of search for these and kind of figure this out, but you've gotten a head start. Should you want to add a subject heading for this or a, a note in your catalog, um, or to just simply do reader's advisory for somebody who, um, just is love, love ch uh, children of uh, blood and bone. You could use AI for read-alikes. In this case, I'm asking for read-alikes for the hate you give. And I got some pretty good suggestions. Um, I could make it more specific, the prompt, and, and, um, and get, get a, a completely different list. You could use this to reduce text complexity. So if I had, um, if I was creating an annotated glossary for, uh, for searching, um, and I had a more sophisticated one for my high school, I have a student who's not a great reader or for whom English is not a first language, I could reduce it, and here I'm asking it to, re to reduce the complexity to a fifth grade reading level. And it did a very nice job, I think. The um, opportunities for translation are, are, are rich. Now, this is, I think, my book list in Ukrainian. I am not qualified to check how um, good the translation is. However, I think it's a start, and I, I think that you might use um, for, uh, foreign language speakers in your community to help you assess the, uh, the use of it. But on the fly, I think it's really helpful. There is no end to the types of study tools you can make. In this case, I asked it to create flash uh, flashcards for a medical school anatomy student, and also to create a Jeopardy game. 
one of the really brilliant ways I've been able to use this um, is to create case studies. I imagined I was working with a business teacher uh, and I wanted case studies relating to ethics in, in terms of leadership. And the three that came up, um, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill with the questions for discussion and the Volkswagen emission scandal um, and the Uber sexual harassment scandal were ones that I might not have discovered on my own and the questions are good and now I've got something that I can enrich or I can help the teacher enrich. Uh, analogies to explain things um, is another way you might use this. Give me an analogy to explain um, how large language models work. Um, you have things like a chef, a savvy detective, um, in any case, th these are just things you can brainstorm with. One thing to take a look at is these are spawning bots. So in large language models, you'll see bots or extensions. And I don't remember which one this is coming for, but you can find all of these little things. Like you can do consensus, which we'll look at in a minute, within a large language model. Scholar AI is a bot that uses the large language model to find scholarly content. And so um, think about this. And, and then, of course, you've got productivity tools, which you're finding more and more embedded within the large language models, as well as in the search engines themselves. This is an example of Poe, and what Poe does is it gathers um, material, it gathers bots and puts them together, kind of like a meta search used to do, uh, and it allows you to discover bots. And so for those of you who may not have the latest version of ChatGPT, sometimes you'll find ChatGPT, the latest version, hiding out in one of these kind of meta, meta um, arrays of things. Uh, if you are more interested in um, search tools specifically than the large language model, there are a number of search tools emerging. Um, this is just a list of some of these. If you use the slides, you'll see that you can click on them and get to them pretty easily. Um, I did, a, this is from Claude, I did a, a table comparison. That's I love that I can get tables to do comparisons. And you can see, you can find out which of these tools searches the web. Um, and what their major features are, what their, their, their superpowers are. For instance, Research Rabbit um, is an academic literature search. Uh, one of the features of Brave is that it's private and it's an independent web search. Um, and you can see the yes column for search is the web, which I think is really important. One thing to know, I mean, I think that one question people have a lot is why should I use an AI tool rather than a traditional search engine? And the reason is sometimes you shouldn't, sometimes you shouldn't. Uh, but what we're searching with search engines, with before all of these things kind of morph their way into our Bing and uh, Google, we're searching literally with keyword matching. Uh, and if we don't have the keywords that match, we're not necessarily going to get the results that we need. Um, when you're using semantic and neural search that we're finding more in the AI search tools, we're finding that our searches um, have understanding of meaning and context, um, and that we're getting a synthesis. Um, and so um, we are finding that they are, um, we're, we're, we're handling synonyms, the words that we missed, um, that we can adapt, we can ask follow-up questions. Uh, and, and so there are advantages and disadvantages, but it's important to know that there is a difference between keyword semantic, semantic and among keyword semantic and neural search. And we'll look at, at some of those in a minute. I asked, um, I asked Bing um, and noticed that Bing always gives me these citations then um, it, for the advantages of AI-powered search tools. And you can see that um, one of the things they do is they analyze. You're getting summaries. Now, within these tools, you can ask for 
better summaries or a, a, alternate summaries. And I, I think that's important. So the, th the thing is, there are many ways that large language models can synthesize. And it's very possible that the first synthesis is not the best synthesis or the one that you need. And so um, your prompts are important, but also recognizing that there are multiple ways to summarize something. And sometimes the initial summary might include bias. I think that's important to know. And so this is just another comparison of keyword versus semantic in neural search. So when we're thinking about the difference between traditional search and AI search, um, on, on a basic level, AI search is linked to keyword matching. You're getting a vertical list of websites as your results. Um, you can personalize this, and it can be personalized automatic for you, automatically for you based on your history and preferences, which the search engine gets to know. And there's no conversation happening. It's a one search experience, and your revision is what sets a conversation, uh, but not really a conversation in action. And uh, the knowledge that you're pulling from is indexed web pages. On the other hand, AI-powered search understands the meaning of natural language queries, including content, context, and intent. It can provide a variety of results in multiple formats. It can personalize results based on deeper understanding of the user. Uh, you can suggest, I am um, a college professor, or I am uh, an academic or a high school librarian, uh, and, then, and then get it to um, personalize the results for your needs. It will support conversational search, so you can revise your search. You don't have to go back in. Um, you can say, give me more of this type, uh, and it will understand that. Uh, and it can process information from a variety of sources, including the real world. So let's take a look at a few of the search engines that incorporate AI. In this case, we're looking for primary sources on the Trail of Tears. And um, we got a list of primary sources. Some are portals, some are individual primary sources. But um, what we're getting here, and we're, we're not click, we're not having clicked on everything that is in the results. But we're we're getting um, a removal. You can see that. Um, well, actually, Bard. One of the things Brave. Um, is proud of is that it respects user, users' privacy. It doesn't keep the stuff for large language training, uh, and you uh, will not have your history in there. Um, it removes the ads, so you're getting a nice, clean uh, result list. In this case, it is a result list. But in addition to a result list, you will get summaries. Um, you'll get translation ability. Uh, you actually have integration with um, the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine. You have discussions in this when um, there are a, con there are, there's contradictory information in a in a provocative kind of issue, and your um, Google's or your sorry your goggles tool um, allows you to focus a lens on different types of results and to re rank results. U.com is a search engine that general that acts as an AI assistant, and it does a great job of finding sources, um, and it it will actually do some writing for you as well. I believe in this case, um, I was asking um, a graduate student conducting a literature review on the conflict of the uh, of the Israel Hamas war. Um, can you give me? the available important articles and documents. And it did a pretty nice job. So I've got a start in terms of, this is this includes primary sources, uh, but note also that I can use u.com to get code, to, act, to get, engage in writing um, creative kinds of materials or to help me study. This is just another example, and in this case, they're showing um, the causes of the American Civil War, which has been in the news. And um, what we're seeing here is um, a summary, uh, a synthesis of what it pulled from these sources. So we're getting um, websites to visit, we're getting related results, 
Uh, we have all the stuff I mentioned in the last slide. And, um, and I think we've gotten a nice overview at, that we might not have gotten in a traditional search engine. In this case, I'm also looking for what the science-based best practices for teaching reading, and I've gotten a list of them, and uh, I've gotten some decent articles um, from uh, across the literature. Now, I'm not fully happy with this. I would want to go into Reading Teacher and some of the journals I could get into in my databases, and that's something I think our students should know. But know that this is probably a really good start and supporting vocabulary that might be needed in a search. Another one is EXA, used to be called Metaphor. Um, it is calling itself the first web scale neural search engine. And it uses an alg, and I don't fully understand this, but it's moving beyond um, keyword search, certainly, but also beyond semantic search. Uh, to using neural search. Um, let us take a look at the search tools are sp that are specifically made for academic search. Many of you are very familiar with JSTOR. Um, we may not be as familiar with a tool they added a few years back called the Text Analyzer. So if you grab an article, um, you could be your own article if you want to put it in there, um, or it could be an article that you got from JSTOR. You drag it into the uh, text analyzer, and this is what you're going to get. Um, so I dragged in an article that I wrote or with my t research team, and it identified keywords or topics, and uh, it found people, and in some cases, the in, in this case, these are my co-authors, it located um Re referenced uh, places, organizations, um, but I like the idea that I can add terms to the prioritized terms that we're seeing there on the top right, and I can use the slider bar to have more or less of a focus on any of those prioritized terms. So it is reading that article, and it is finding great um, results for me based So it is reading the article that I uploaded and it is finding great results for me based just on the article. Another one that does this is called Kenius, uh, find research relevant to any document. And this one I find really interesting, it's 2D search. And what it will do is it will create an advanced search for me based on um, the terms that I add or the question that I put in there. So notice that it's doing a kind of logic graph for me, a logic table. Um, notice that it is generating um, it is generating a search syntax for me that I might be able to use, say, in dialog or um, a, a command line search. I think it's interesting that I don't have an operator in between all my lists of ors and the facets, but um, I can add, add that fairly easily. So what it's doing is it's generating the keywords for me and, and creating syntax. Um, this is a free version. Um, some of these are free, some are not. This one looks promising. It's a free AI a search engine, and um, you can focus on asking it for different types of research in, in case um, you want to review a case report, clinical trials, a data set, a meta-analysis, etc. Now for the lit review, um, I think this is really remarkable stuff. Um, you can easily use connected papers to connect papers in a visual graph. And so um, what you're seeing here is authors and articles um, that are connected to a particular paper that either you wrote or you found. And so it's kind of like a Spotify for research. 
It's not the only one. Um, you can use lit maps. So if you're doing a capstone project in the high school, or if you're doing um, a lit review as um, an academic, or you're a graduate student, um, for many people, you're discovering names. And sometimes these names, uh, you can search by ORCID number. Uh, sometimes these names are in disciplines that you would not have imagined. I believe I started with Ethan Malik, who I mentioned earlier, and I now I'm seeing all the people who are quoting him or people who have things in common with him. Another one is Open Knowledge Maps. This one kind of reminds me of some of the tools that are used in Gale, and it's allowing me to search across um, databases that I believe are available for free, and, um, and this is kind of a handy starting point. And Scholar AI works within the ChatGPT uh, large language model. You can see that you get a certain amount of searches for free, which is the case with many of these. Um, but these are good, I think, for students to give, give a try. And this is an example of um, what I was, uh, my test for uh, Scholar AI and uh, what are the use cases for AI in research? And so you can see that it's given me a number of um, reasons. This one is perplexity and uh, another academic search tool. In this case, I wanted to start on my research. Um, so I'm asking it in this case again for some primary sources. Share a variety of soliloquies from female characters in Shakespeare's tragedies for me to compare. So not only did it give me the act and scene, but it gave me a brief summary of the soliloquy. And now I can um, really play with these and do the analysis on my own. Consensus is used um, to identify disagreements and to quickly see the various perspectives in an area of research. So you get a summary and then you get a consens consensus meter and you have all sorts of filters uh, with which you can uh, focus your query. Now I like, the th I like what you're getting here in terms of your results. You're getting the results. You get a consensus on the first page with that meter, but you're also getting a note about the ranking of the journal and the, uh, the, 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 how highly the paper it's, is cited. So you know uh, you may be guided to what you might best use. Notice that you have opportunities to easily cite here, and these are some of the filters that you can use in consensus. Others include size space, which is a scientific corpus of literature that you can search, and it, has, it claims to have uh, more than 270 million papers to explore. You can watch that video. And again, you can, you can choose what types of material that you want, similar to um, the fields in a database. Um, you've got a few more options like uh, too long didn't read um, and summarized abstracts. Semantic Scholar is also a, a wonderful resource of, again, more than 200 million papers from all fields of science. Let's watch the introductory video for Semantic Scholar. Semantic Scholar is a free AI-powered academic search engine with more than 200 million papers covering all disciplines. A free service from the Allen Institute for AI, our mission is to use artificial intelligence to accelerate scientific progress. We use advanced AI to extract and summarize the meaning of papers and generate new research recommendations on the research dashboard. We also provide open resources for developers, like the Semantic Scholar Academic Graph, API, and datasets. To get started, visit semanticscholar.org and search for any query. You can create a free account to save papers to your library and view your recommendation feeds. Filter by field, date range, conference, and more to refine the results. On paper pages, we use AI models to summarize a research publication. 
view figures and tables, and navigate citations to find connections to other papers. We offer many ways to explore our citation graph. Our system indexes billions of citations, using AI models to classify the intent and predict the influence of each. Find citation type by scrolling to the citations listed for any paper and using the citation type filter. Semantic Scholar classifies some citations as highly influential, allowing scholars to quickly determine which publications to read in depth. Search, filter, and sort a paper citations. Save the paper to your library. Generate an alert for new citations of that paper, or view related papers. Visit your research dashboard often for new paper recommendations, and set up daily or weekly email alerts to stay up to date. Join our global research community at semanticscholar.org. About Semantic Scholar is that it's free, and it offers these really powerful tools that will help both um, the established scholar as well as somebody new to scholarship uh, as they begin to understand how articles are connected beyond the notion of keywords they may or may not be able to identify, controlled vocabulary they may or may not be able to access. This works on the semantic search um, and possibly the neural search that we were talking about earlier. While this one is free, Research Rabbit is also powerful, um, but I do not believe it is free. Let's take a look at that video. Hi, I'm Mike from Research Rabbit, and in this demo, I'm going to show how Research Rabbit is completely different from Google and reimagines discovery for knowledge. But first, here's Google. In Google, you start with a keyword and then get a list of results. You start scrolling down, opening up a bunch of links, and in terms of relevance, the items at the top are most relevant, and relevancy declines as you scroll down. You click Next Page, and relevancy declines further. And sooner or later, you enter a new keyword and start all over again. At the end of this process, you have a bunch of tabs. They all look different. The data comes from a specific walled garden. Clicking on metadata opens more tabs. And you've gotten completely lost with all this stuff. By contrast, here's Research Rabbit. In Research Rabbit, you can start by entering keywords like Google, but also title, author, identifier, and RIS and bib text file formats, which researchers use. And now I'm going to show you what you can do after adding a single paper. Based on a single paper, you can see the author, year, title, abstract, all of the references and how they relate, all of the citations and how they relate, and similar papers that Research Rabbit has found. The graphs that emerge enable users to understand relationships amongst the content and is a really intuitive way to understand large amounts of information. These graphs are also interactive and can be viewed in different ways. For example, our timeline view is super helpful. Finally, these graphs can serve as jumping off points for additional discovery. If any of the papers look interesting, you can dive deeper and learn more. And let's say instead of a paper, you want to explore an author. We've activated that metadata as well. By selecting an author instead, you can pull all of that author's papers and see them along the timeline too. You can also visualize their collaboration network. Each of these dots is a person that Gulkan Garib has authored with in the past. And as before, you can use the graph as a jumping off point. Finally, at the end of all this, let's say you found a paper that's absolutely perfect. You can simply drag and drop it into your collection. So that's the first amazing thing about Research Rabbit. You don't have to rely on keywords. You can explore however you like, from papers to authors to graphs. And you can also follow the breadcrumbs to remember how you got to where you are and quickly go back to where you started. The next amazing thing about Research Rabbit is our positive feedback loop, or what we call our Spotify for papers. As you can see here, the numbers will update as you add papers into your collection. Research Rabbit is learning what you're interested in and generating better and better results in real time. Our relevancy increases as you use the app, whereas Google relevancy decreases over time. Finally, based on the items in your collection, Research Rabbit keeps track of all of the new papers that are published. And if and only if Research Rabbit thinks something is super relevant, we'll go ahead and email you on a Sunday night. We don't spam you with noisy alerts based on keywords. There's a lot more features and capabilities here, but these are some key value props that set us apart from every other discovery tool out there. Our platform is purpose built for identifying key knowledge content and experts and we're excited to serve researchers around the world. Thanks. Among the other academic search tools is Illicit, um, which 
gives you article summaries, allows you to connect papers in a way similar to the ones we just looked at, um, and it is really an excellent tool for lit review. What it also does is it creates tables. And so you can have your summary on the top with a, an abstract of the paper uh, that you select, but notice below that um, is this table. So you have the paper next to the paper and you have multiple papers listed in, the, in, in each column in, and you have multiple papers listed in a column. And next to the paper, you'll find the abstract and then um, you will be able to extract from that main findings, um, interventions, the scientific types of fields that you are typical to find, um, limitations, and so on. Um, so it is. it allows you to organize the results from your lit review and extract the information that's relevant for each of those papers. So it's a really handy, handy way to approach a lit review. You may find your students are beginning to use AI tools as research assistants. You may want to have conversations at the assessment level about what's appropriate, what's academically honest, what preserves student creativity, uh, what is the work you want done, and what is the work that it would be okay to have the generative AI tool do. Among them are summarizing tools, interacting with PDFs, um, rewriting tools, and there's a whole other category of those writing tools as well. Um, um, several of them allow you to chat with a PDF. This one's called chatpdf.com, but there are many of these. And they allow um, students to get summaries of the PDFs, to ask questions of the PDFs. In addition, tools like ScholarSee uh, Act, summarize uh, articles for them and actually can create tools for studying as well. Tools like Quillbot will paraphrase uh, a, a text and they can just paste the text in and get it paraphrased and they can also get translations. Let's move on to um, instructional tools that you're going to find helpful and um, and maybe even make your lessons more engaging. CurePod is one of my favorites. It allows me to create lesson plans. It's designed for K-12, but I find that it's helpful beyond K-12. Um, so what it does is it creates instruction in slide deck format. Uh, you can ask it to do nearly anything. So I asked it to do a lesson for science using the next generation science standards. I wanted exit tickets. I wanted interactivities. I wanted questions to consider. And it did a pretty good job. Um, so here's an example of what some of the slides look like, a did you know slide, um, a question to get people thinking, a think pair share activity. Um, there were definitely exit tickets and images, um, and I also asked it to interact with one of the um, feedback tools, and I don't remember which one at this point, but it worked very well. Another lesson, another lesson planning tool is called Schemely. This one it doesn't work on the slide deck format, but it creates, as you can see, a traditional lesson plan that is fully blown, and um, it's as good as the it's as good as what you input. Um, you put in your learning objectives. You put in it. It'll actually will generate vocabulary. Uh, it'll give a content summary. It's all editable, and you can ask it to suggest activities um, and. I, I just think it's a great starting point, although I wouldn't use something straight out of the box. I really do like Presto. Presto is a writing prompt generator, and uh, it does a variety of grade levels. I think the 12th grade material is editable for the university if you want. I In this one, for this example, I wanted a writing topic on invasive species for eighth grade. And you can see the pull down offered me many different types of writing, a news article, story, personal narrative, op-ed, review, sequence, cause effect, compare and contrast, problem and solution. And I love that it, um, created these scenarios for me. So the op-ed might be written by a biologist studying the effects of an invasive species on the local ecosystem. Describe in detail how the species has been disruptive, what possible solutions might be implemented to restore the balance. 
Other scenarios are you're an ambassador to a new planet and you have the difficult task of trying to convince its inhabitants that invasive species are bad for their environment and that you're writing the op-ed there. And the other one is you're an environmental scientist in charge of finding ways to stop the spread of the environment, of the invasive species. So these are very clever and of course they are great appropriate and I think you'll enjoy that one. For differentiation, I really like the tool Diffit. It not only does differentiation, but it also does translation. You tell it what types of sources that you want it to use. Uh, you can add images. In this case, I was um, trying to explain Russia's war in Ukraine using articles from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. And it adapted the reading passages. It summarized, it gave me the sources that it selected, uh, and it, then it, it offered me the opportunity to ask questions as well. And so I could ask questions that dealt with basic comprehension, simple reasoning, strategic thinking, extended thinking, and it also offered me uh, different types of prompts, so open prompts or multiple choice, I believe. Uh, and this, this is an awfully handy tool with all the different students we have in our classroom, the, the number of immigrants we have entering our classroom, this can be incredibly useful. There's a category of tools that I think of as Swiss Army Knife tools. Copilot is one of them. Uh, look at all these options it will uh, address for you in terms of um, quiz builders, lesson planners, educational handouts, idea generators, PowerPoint generators, uh, writing prompts, student report ideas. So the Copilot is one of them. This is not Microsoft Copilot. Uh, it's another one that's co Copilot, I believe, for one of the, the large language models. This is an example of one of the things that uh, tra uh, that this is an example of one of the things that Copilot does with its Swiss Army knife. It created a unit for me on the Trail of Tears, so it suggested outlines for 10 days, and it also offered resources for that those 10, 10 days of learning, uh, and it is a, a great starting point. For all of these things I'm showing you, I'm using the free version, and if I really, really love them, I could subscribe, but very often the free version gives me enough opportunities um, that I, I, I stay within, uh, within my budget of free. This is another one. I think this is my favorite. This is Magic School AI. It was created by an educator, and it keeps adding features. Um, among the features, including, oh, just there's so much here, but among the features are suggestions for AI-resistant assignments. Uh, are they completely AI-resistant? I'm not so sure. But, um, but I would take a look at this and share this with teachers. This would be a great PD opportunity for your teachers. This is what it looks like, uh, and this is kind of the, uh, when I asked for an AI assignment, uh, a resistant assignment, this is uh, one of the outputs. Another Swiss Army knife of sorts is EDU GPT, which um, these are not real people. These are bots that are expert with the, um, the tools that you see here, and it's a growing number of tools. So if you work in Kahoot or Google Classroom or Canva or Seesaw, this will um, create uh, ideas for you when you're using these other digital tools. One of the skills that we all need to get better at is prompt crafting. This is a Pearl Trees collection on prompt crafting. It's heavy on the education sector, but it has an awful lot of material for anybody who is trying to improve their prompts, including uh, prompts for creating art and video. I think what's really important as we look at AI in education and in our lives, but especially in education, is that we're creating guidelines for the, the students we work with, not at the district level necessarily and not at the course level, but I believe that we have to make these guidelines happen at the assessment level. Each course is going to look different. 
Each assessment will look different and may require different types of tasks. So you're deciding which tasks you want to be human-focused and human-generated and which ones are okay. For instance, finding keywords, perhaps, um, might be better off or, or, or more thorough, uh, more, abil- more able to see all the dots around you that are disconnected across disciplines and languages and, and geographic locations. Um, and so that's a decision that you might have to make at the assessment level. I don't think we're going to make guidelines today or tomorrow and have them stay forever. I think we're going to need to review any policies and guidelines we put in place. Some of you may remember uh, Danny Dunn and the homework machine. I am old enough to remember uh, this magical moment where the machine does Danny and his friends homework. Uh, but I think that that's not the way it's going to happen, of course. It may look like that to kids, but it won't if we actually put um, descriptions of what we expect in our courses, if we help students, if we're librarians, help them understand what is expected from the teachers, work with faculty members to create both assessment and course-level guidelines. Uh, and this is one of the ones that you may be familiar with. I think this is mine for um, search in the information landscape if you're in this class. Uh, but you'll, you'll be familiar with um, how I, I, I believe that for some of our searching activities, uh, generative AI is perfectly fine. Uh, but for your reflections, I want acknowledgments. I want you to know which tools you, you used, how were they used, what were your prompts and refinements, uh, in what ways or and to what degree did the tools support or not support your effort, and what did you learn from the process. And so that's what we're considering. There are a, a number of states that are creating generative AI implementation toolkits. Uh, many of them have red light, green light uh, kinds of approaches. This is North Carolina as just one example. We are seeing an awful lot of material from people like Matt Miller, who I mentioned earlier, uh, and who has designed a spectrum of uh, how does work look from all AI to all human. Um, this is a sample district policy um, with a checklist kind of approach and another type of scale. This is based on a research uh, study um, that suggested um, a scale of AI to no AI use and with different types of tasks having different colors assigned to them. I cleaned that up a little bit and created this one. This is Matt Miller's from that textbook um, um, that ranges from more human work to more AI creation. And here is an even simpler version of that from student created to bot created. And this really will help teachers and faculty members uh, consider what is appropriate for what type of assessment. Edutopia talked about the stoplight model and they're not the only ones, Uh, just a hundred people are working on this. Uh, and this is uh, Ryan Watkins' work in which he has created a Google form to help people come up with this red, yellow, green chart. Uh, and so you fill out the form in a Google, in a, in a Google form, and uh, it, they'll, the output will have, look something like this on the bottom. Can I use AI on this assignment? This is a little bit more. And AI for Education created this kind of flowchart of when to use and when not, depending upon what you want to do, what types of tasks, and what your teachers are expecting of you. I love this. This is Lance Eaton's work where um, uh, several months ago he began collecting uh, classroom policies for AI tools. Some of them are K-12, most of them are at the university level. And if you do a control F, you can find them for, um, for uh, business classes or English classes or social work classes. And so um, that's really helpful and it was a crowdsourced effort. Now there are a number of uh, efforts to create documentation style for AI use. I've found that um, in many cases, I don't really need to cite AI. It's a synthesis and I'm not really using it and quoting it, but uh, I I do 
find the original sources and some of the generative AI I use, and then I go to that. But if you find it helpful, these are some documentation styles that you might use and share with um, students and faculty. These I have to warn you about. These are the detection tools. Um, there is so much writing about the number of false positives out there that I would worry about using these and relying on them. There is so many really great examples of statements. Um, again, I think these have to happen on the assessment level, but you can have statements about how a particular school or group of schools is using AI. In this case, this is the International Baccalaureate School Statement. Uh, the IB believes that artificial intelligence will become part of our everyday lives like spell checkers, trans translation software, calculators. We therefore need to adapt and transform our educational programs and assessment practices so students can use these new AI tools ethically and effectively. This is, um, Stanford is developing a wonderful course. The initial lessons look pretty fabulous and, um, and they're making it open access so that you can use them. There's so many more on our generative AI hyperdoc and in our petting zoo, so this is just one example. Another example is the free Khan Academy course, uh, AI for Education. I think it's got realistic um, expectations of students and, and uh, great units for, for teachers who want to get uh, up to date on use of AI in the classroom. So you need to consider what your conversations about academic honesty will look, what they'll look like, what's acceptable when, as we talked about that stoplight thing, is relating to any particular assessment, is brainstorming with AI okay, is using it to find sources, summarizing reading content, summarizing resource content for your research, um, summarizing video content, outlining, grammar check, paraphrasing, editing feedback for style, citation support, generating thesis statements, suggesting research questions. There are a whole lot of um, there's a whole lot of um, nuance here. What is okay and what's not okay? The best thing I think you can do is have conversations with students about this. And this will depend upon what skills you teach and what are the most critical and essential to preserve. What AI tools will look like in your students' most likely futures and how might you prepare and empower students and encourage them to make decisions that are safe and ethical. And remember, this is really going to look different in an art class, in a creative writing class, from the way, and a coding class, from the way it might look in uh, general studies or um, an AP history classroom. So all of these things are going to be contextual. We are in the midst of a whirlwind. I believe this landscape will continue to shift, and what we have to do is encourage transparency and process, engage in more flipping so more activities can happen in the classroom where the students are actually engaging and analyzing and, and creating and thinking together. Um, Policies we establish today might need to be revised tomorrow, but I believe we need to avoid the punitive gotchas and uh, favor concert con conversations about cultures of academic honesty. I want to remind you that I've got this huge petting zoo that has a lot of the material that we shared in this lecture and so much more, and it's all categorized, and you're welcome to use it all. I want to remind you that we've got Pearl Trees collections on nearly everything. And I want to remind you also that we've got this wonderful, at least I think it's wonderful, petting zoo that you're welcome to make a copy of and use. And in this one, um, we've got another link to the, the uh, HyperDoc, but these are categorized um, um, explorations. So if you want your your colleagues to explore art and design tools, um, these are all these were all linked to the section. Um, there are other links for each of the sections. I'm, we're asking questions like, what are the most promising tools? When might you introduce their use? And these are what the categories look like. They're hyperlinked. And if you clicked on one of these, like, mm, like art and design, it will take you to a list of art and design tools that I think are really worth exploring. And then ask you this question. And if you've made a copy of this, um, the people who are participating can easily jot down some notes in small groups and then come back to a large group discussion. 
And so I hope you found this valuable. I know it's been a little long, uh, uh, but I, I want to make sure that you have these resources that you can go back to on the slide deck uh, and ask me any questions if you have them. Thank you.